What's going on guys, Ari over here and welcome back to another uh, kind of episode of the Pit Lane Podcast, but it's it's episode 5.5. This is going to be the supplementary to uh, podcast number 5. We mentioned that we may do some extra stuff and obviously you can see by the title, we're doing a bit of a Bahrain preview. Obviously, uh, we're back here with myself, Arav, Tom today and Callum's not actually with us because he's on holiday in Germany, but he would be back with us for the uh, aftermath of Bahrain when we do a discussion about the race, so don't worry about that. But we're going to get straight into it today. So obviously, one of the biggest uh, talking points of the Grand Prix weekend so far is that Fernando Alonso uh, is out of the Bahrain Grand Prix. He's not allowed to race on medical grounds. Uh, you know, a fractured rib, was it? And some uh, just general not completely recovered. There's even doubt that he may even make the Chinese Grand Prix. And so that means Stoffel van Dorn is in for McLaren. So, Tom, what do you think about that? Because um, I think all of us were very, very intrigued. Well, it was an interesting... Um, it was a bit out of nowhere, wasn't it? Um, they just... Alonso was pretty confident he was going to race. You know, everyone didn't really talk about it. He got out of the car in Australia absolutely fine. Everyone was like, okay, I'm sure he'll be fine for the next race in two weeks' time. And then out of nowhere, was it Thursday? The yeah, it was broke Thursday. Out of yeah. nowhere, really yeah. just... And um, it was just announced. But um, just to specify, I think he had, like you mentioned, uh, broken ribs. And all, I think he had a partially collapsed lung as well right okay a, a, yeah. a small and there was also uh, just a bit there was like there was one medical anyone. term which i can't even remember what the hell it was but oh, yeah, it I started know. with a ph yeah. and like ended in an x i can't remember what the name is but um yeah I know just, what you mean. yeah yeah it so was, um <laughs> i think what i think what they meant was alonso's got a condition where on the side where he's apparently broken a rib or two and he's yeah. had this collapsed lung he's got a condition where essentially when when you're when you're a baby and you're being gro- and you and you grow up your ribs and your muscle in that area yeah. just doesn't develop as well as the other side. Oh, right. So he's weak on that side a little bit anyway. Ah. So that is an issue. Obviously, yep. we know, like you mentioned, that he'd be a doubt for China. Rib injuries tend to take quite a while to recover. They're a very slow healing process. Yeah. So... I think it'd be quite unlikely we see Alonso at the Chinese Grand Prix person myself. Yeah, which is a huge thing for Stoffel van Dorn. Obviously, if you don't know who, because there's a few people on Twitter who didn't know who Stoffel van Dorn is, but uh, you might have been living under a rock. Basically, he's the GP2 champion. He won it last year. He won it with uh, two entire race weekends to go. He won it at Sochi. Um, and you know, just, just completely hailed around the paddock as probably one of the best drivers that wasn't in Formula 1 before he got into the seat today. But yeah, he's in action at Bahrain. He didn't look too bad. Tom, you brought up a good point before we actually started recording about the fact he hasn't actually had much or any running and he's doing really well, like solid. Oh yeah, literally, like I, I told you before we got on, it's like, it's not like, uh, for example, Alfonso Chedis Jr. who ran in FP1 today, literally Stoffel Weiss and had a single lap in the MP4 31. He's gone straight in there. And bear in mind, this isn't like testing where you've literally got free to do laps. This is Alonso's car, so you've got to keep the mileage on the engine relatively low, you know, and try not to break the car and all that yeah, sort of stuff. That's the so biggest thing. <laughs> he's, he's having to do very limited running whilst trying to learn as much as he can. And he wasn't too bad to be fair to him. Like I did say, uh, he was nine tenths off of Jensen Button in FP1, I believe, and then seven tenths in FP2. Yeah, FP2. So not too shabby from him. I think he finished P11. I yeah, think. FP2, yeah. Stoffel van Dorn was in Lenpla. I've got it on my side here. That's what I'm looking over here. So Stoffel van Dorn with a 132.99. Nine, nine button with a 132.281 uh, so not too bad in terms as you mentioned um you know if he's if he's had no simulator running of the i'm he might have had like a little bit of simulator running but probably not a lot because obviously he's only the reserve driver Te- you know they really didn't plan on yeah. alonso going out of action um and you know he had to f- had take a late flight from uh what was it japan he was getting ready for testing yeah, well, he's in he's prepping for super formula in japan yeah, so, so that's where his focus lied in theory, yeah, he was ready. Thursday. He had to catch so, a late flight. <laughs> like I said, the simulator work for him in in McLaren in Woking was very very limited because he's prepping for a season in Super Formula, and I think he might even miss the first few rounds depending on how many races Alonso misses. But it's definitely an interesting one and a good chance for Stoffel van Dorn. Obviously, everyone's been calling for his name to be to be in F1, you know, because um, it was sort of a similar thing with Kevin Magnussen at the time when he came into the scene. Yeah, and there was even rumours that him like. Stoff and uh, Magnussen would be teammates at some point, but you know people don't want uh, Van Dorn to get the the Magnussen treatment, so people are sort of cherishing his his rare appearance until at least further notice. But, yeah, you know, I think it's also a bigger deal because he, he the way he won GP two 
with you know the the wins he had were so controlled and measured so uh it's definitely a very exciting prospect and uh definitely something we'll be looking at with you know much intrigue for the Bahrain Grand Prix it's going to be very interesting to see how he does but anyway talking about the performance of drivers and generally obviously we had FP1 FP2 FP2 just ended uh you know 20 minutes ago as we're recording this obviously generally in Bahrain for the night race FP2 is more important than FP1 because FP1 is during the daytime so I'm actually uh, Tom I hope you agree we're not really going to look into FP1 too much no, I, mean, I mean there's not really the track any point was really dusty to be honest. as well and there was limited running I think yeah. Ferrari did like 12 laps so yeah. it was like it so was very poor FP2 uh, we're just a little rundown so Rosberg came in first place with 131 dead pretty much uh, 001 if you want to be technical Lewis Hamilton second place 131.242 storming lap by Nico Rosberg um setting the time alight and I think I think what was it we saw a few tweets on Twitter about the Imperial March music starting with Mercedes they yeah, look very they tasty look really strong <laughs> they, look, they look incredibly strong I did tweet out like people reckon there's not a major difference but I, I personally think they look miles ahead compared to Australia for some reason like in Australia even though they were about a second ahead Friday was still like six, seven tenths behind, but for some reason, Friday have looked nowhere this weekend so far. I think they've got their cards fairly close to their chest, but it was like the major highlight of FP2 uh, because of this Mercedes pace is that Jensen Button got P3 yeah. somehow. And then once a bit... <laughs> It was pretty crazy. How it happened? I, yeah, I'm not too sure how legitimate this uh, third place is, but I, I literally was like, "Stop the session now!" He's in third, <laughs> and thankfully he finished in third. Um, so that's going to be interesting to keep an eye out because obviously, looking at the tie, the tires used. Jensen used uh, mediums at the start of the session, then super softs, uh, then a fresh set of super softs, two used sets of super softs, and then a set of used mediums. So um, the time was on super softs. So obviously, most team, most of the drivers did set a lap time on. Super Supersoft, so there is some sort of thing to look into it, but obviously Ferrari didn't have the best day at the end of FP2 with um, Vettel peeling off, so obviously they haven't shown their full hand, uh, we were talking about it before, again that uh, we both sort of agree that Ferrari are maybe keeping their cards close to their chest, not exactly showing, you know, flexing their muscles if you will, but um, do you want to talk through the issues uh, Vettel had today, Tom? Well, obviously uh, if those of you who didn't watch FP2, then Vettel was just doing his laps, he was doing a stint right towards the end of FP2, and then I think like the second or third lap into his stint, he said the car felt sick, and then after that he followed up saying the car felt strange, and then a lap later or so, he popped back up on the monitor, and he'd actually slowed right down, he was just pulling over to the side, and at first everyone thought it might have been the engine, because Vettel did state it, he, like his car was sick, and it wasn't until like at the end of FP2, or literally as the flag dropped, they showed a replay, and it showed that his left rear was off the car, so it turns out, Freud didn't put the uh, actual bolt on the left rear on properly. However, he did manage to do like, f I think, four laps until he noticed yeah. that he physically couldn't continue. So who knows what could happen there? Obviously, it depends because in terms of safety grounds, F1 generally is quite strict with the tyre thing. So it could be a grid penalty coming in Ferrari's way, quite, quite honestly. Or it could be just a hefty fine. We don't really know. Obviously, FP2 is just finished. But it's definitely gonna. It's definitely hampered Ferrari. Obviously, Vettel was, like you said, um, the only guy who did not run the super softs at the top ten yeah. in FP2. So obviously, his lap time is a bit. You know, you can't really take it for granted. But um, I just want to quickly uh, say, Arif, the bar the Mercedes, who were one point two seconds faster than yeah. um, McLaren, from third place, I think the next fourteen cars down, there was one point two, the exact same gap between fourteen cars. Yeah, so uh, it, Jensen Button was 1.2 off uh, Nico Rosberg's time. Then if we look down all, all the way till Stoffel van Dorn, 11th place, that's 1.9 off. And then even further th down than that, the next huge leap is all the way down to 18th place, Julian Palmer, 2.6. And then after that, there's an entire three-tenths jump. But from Julian Palmer up to Button, everyone sort of trickles down... 10th by 10th like you know you've got one person yeah. on 2.4 2.3 2.17 2.12 it's all very 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 close there in terms of the inter-team battle so very interesting to see in terms of how close that's gonna be obviously Bahrain's usually quite a close circuit at least for the v6 era we've seen um in 2014 you know teams were kind of side by side almost like Catalonia in in the part gate uh, days gone past where it's more about the car performance than the than the driver really and you saw teams yeah. so close to each other in terms of their teammates um uh, go on yeah go on go, what are you gonna say no I, I find it staggering like the fact obviously like we said we can't read too much into buttons third place but it's like if you look I think Williams and Red Bull they were like 8th 9th 10th 11th or thereabouts and it was like Toro Rosso who were like sharp up the top 
the top six, you could say, and also Ferrari. So obviously we could like specify like what's the word? We could um, speculate. speculate. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah, we could speculate if McLaren will drop through the field a bit, but at the same time, it's a bit of a coincidence that both Williams and Red Bull and Toro so and Ferrari haven't. None of them have actually gone ahead of them. It'd be strange if all four cars yeah. jumped ahead. Yeah. So there's got to be something there because even Van Dorn, like we said, in his first weekend. 11th place, but he's only yeah. like a couple of tenths off of the Williams and the Red Bulls, and that's the first time he's ever driven the car before. So yeah, I mean, there's um, got to be something to it. I mean, FP2 it, generally, obviously, time. for race run, it's obviously more for race run. So obviously, they're not focusing on the overall time, but obviously, all of them at some point did run the super softs, or most of them did in that session, and obviously, they would be pushing at the start, and then obviously, they're trying to do a tire, um, a race stint. So, you know, obviously, they'll just try and manage it and you know, see how it goes. And generally, obviously, we saw Ferrari 5th and 6th, then we got the Danica Fiat in 7th, Bottas 8th, Ricardo 9th, Massa 10th, and then Van Dorn 11th. So, as you mentioned, Van Dorn not too far off, because uh, he's 1.9 off Rosberg, Massa was 1.8. So, yeah, very close for someone who hasn't had much experience on with that specific car on the track. So, yeah, it's going to be a very interesting one. Uh, obviously, again, FP3 tomorrow is, again, a bit of a... It's almost like a throwaway session in terms of... Usually, FP3 is for the qualifying pace, for the qualifying runs. But, again, FP3 is during the daytime, uh, leaning a bit more towards the nighttime. Um, so, it's going to be interesting to see how everything lines up there. But I really think it will just be down to... Uh, Q1, Q2, Q3, who who really the, steps up to the mark. Obviously, in infamous qualifying. For yeah, I was just about game. to mention the uh, yeah. lovely elimination qualifying that's staying on for uh, for Bahrain. We'll see how that goes. Fingers crossed it's not such uh, a wreck fest in Q3. I sort of <laughs> want it to be, though. Yeah. That, 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 that would basically mean that yeah, they exactly. get rid of it. If it's somewhat okay, <laughs> then they might think, yeah, we was right all along. We've got something really good here. See what I mean? And they, they'll <laughs> keep it somehow. So I'd rather it go yep, yep, yep. <laughs> horribly bad, like just a calamity and they completely yeah. scrap it altogether. But um, now you mentioned, obviously, FP3. Uh, to, uh, tonight, Williams are flying out their new nose, which was meant to come Australia, but yeah. they failed various crash tests. And yep. I was watching FP1 and Ted Kravitz was talking about it. And if you happen to be in, I think, Heathrow Airport tonight, then you may see uh, <laughs> Williams mechanic shipping out. Yeah, a little me, martini <laughs> box. <laughs> they, 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 it's going to arrive late tonight and they're going to be running that all through FP3 and hopefully they feel comfortable enough to run it for the race. They reckon this is quite an aggressive design and a new way of like um, a new development path for Williams, something that they can look into over the season and hope to develop quite nicely. So it's going to be quite intriguing. It could be something very similar to what they've got now, something radically different, maybe like what Mercedes have got. Who knows? But um, that's going to be an interesting one to look out for. And then obviously on the topic of upgrades, then we've already, the second race of the season, the cars have already brought upgrades for this race. You know, uh, Yeah, Renault flyaway brand race. New, and already... Brand new front wing. I think McLaren brought an updated front wing as well. Um, teams like Mana, Ferrari, they've all brought little bits. I think even Mercedes as well. So teams already bring in upgrades, which is good to see. And um, definitely can't wait to get back to the European season because that's when we'll see who can really, who really yeah. has the budget to progress this season. Who can splash who can the cash the and make yeah, it really so go. It's going to be quite tasty. I do want to touch up on my favourite team, sort of, or favourite Batman. <laughs> and, uh, now Tom's he, little uh, gem of the season. <laughs> yeah, I, I, st I still believe something will happen. I mean, hey, I'm not the only one. Johnny Herbert said they'd get points this weekend, so I'm not alone there. But um, Manor look decent. Sauber seem to be their rivals for this weekend, which is quite sad. For Sauber, they really seem to be struggling. There wasn't, they haven't been able to replicate the sort of start they had last year uh, at Australia in the first couple of races and get some points. And they really seem to be struggling at the moment. Just lack of funds. Just yeah, you know, a late car launched. I think they they did say a really aggressive car and it ended up pretty much looking the same <laughs> as last year's one. Yeah, if aggressive is you the know. new translation for timid as fuck. <laughs> it's just the state of it. I honestly think. As the season progresses, I think you'll see Mana overtake Sauber. I think Mana have got the budget. There's a reason why they've developed the endurance team. So the guy who owns Mana now, the, state, like, the main guy, yeah. he definitely has fun because he's I just... in two different series. Whereas Sauber are sort of like, they're just grasping onto the last bit now. I think they're, <laughs> they're really struggling. I think their development tunnel is getting a bit thin as well. Yeah, they're I just, a bit. I need to see some proof of it, a uh, proof of practice on track. Obviously, Tom uh, sort of was doing a bit of defending for Manor in terms of 
you know, Australia, they had some really bad tyre day, but, you know, they've got the same speed as Mercedes now in a straight line. So for me, they need to produce in terms of, they need to show that they're making up the numbers aerodynamically at some point in the season. Obviously, maybe not now straight away. When Europe comes around, they can ship those parts for, you know, cheaper than they can ship them to Bahrain. They need to come out and really actually prove that they're going to improve. Um, for me, to start even getting a bit hopeful. Because I did sort of get hopeful and sort of went, okay, Tom, you've got some fair points pre-season. But then Australia came around, Australia qualifying Q1. And it was like, oh, it's just good old same manner. So I need some I need some convincing. But uh, just finally, I think we should start to wrap up the, the talk about qualifying. Final point for qualifying, I thought, was um, Haas had a bit of an issue at the end of FP2. We had, I, I think it was Grosjean, because I just got into the house as yeah, FP2 was, was ending. Was but it was Grosjean, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, Grosjean, Grosjean was, yeah. had an issue with his front wing. And there was some debate on Sky's broadcast with Paul DeResta and Crofty about if the front wing, the, the talk about general safety of the front wing, is it you know, tested enough, the pylons tested enough. And also, um, you know, they were debating, is it riding lower than some other cars in that if maybe the rumble strip made it go lower? Just generally, they've had some issues with that front end. You know, obviously it came off in testing, so they're going to have to, I feel like they're going to have to refine that. Did it come off Australia? Um, No, I don't think so. But don't quote me on that. But it definitely came off in testing. I'm not sure either. And they had to reinforce it and go slower than they had to one of the testing uh, days. But... And in Australia, I don't believe they had an issue with it. But obviously, Bahrain's got a bit more of an aggressive uh, track layout in terms of the yeah. curbing as well. Um, that's also just a general thing, that this is the first time we're seeing sort of a more thoroughbred track, if you can call it that, even though Bahrain's relatively cars. new. But yeah, it's more demanding. Melbourne, obviously, is street circuit. It can be very deceptive in what car performs better you know we've seen back in 2013 mclaren's car performed differently from australia to malaysia so it's uh, all thrown up in the air a little bit from basically the mercedes downward that some things never change just mercedes constant but i think that we're going to call that a time on qualifying so we're going to move on to generally news outside of the paddock in terms of off track so tom i believe you have a little bit of a list so i'll let you kind of steer this part of the podcast well, there's been quite a fair bit of news this past week. We don't normally talk about news leading up to race weekend because we just basically focus it on the podcast, it's on the actual race podcast yeah. itself. But there has been quite a few talking points that I think we should discuss, with the main one being Formula One management and the state of how they're, they're what their direction is regarding Formula One, yeah, and just the worldwide <laughs> branding and their appreciation for the fans. Now, obviously, this is quite a tasty one, so I think we'll get straight straight into it. So. Generally, there's been a couple of articles up this week, and I think, I uh, if you can back me up on this, but there's been various Twitter accounts, F1 Twitter accounts, for example, like F1 Grand Prix Times, uh, Autosport, you know, like these sort of accounts are based themselves off of, make or make a living as such, based off of F1 and the tweets they put out. And a couple of accounts, I think, like, something like a combined 150,000 followers between, I think, three accounts got shut down by following because they had the word F1 in their name. Yeah, it was, um, it was an article in Grand Prix. It was, it was more or less actual the established press. But it was more just huge accounts with quite good followings in terms of, um, mainly a lot of the Instagram accounts. You know, you had Instagram accounts with F1 images or, you know, just F1 in their name. And they were posting, uh, you know, image, images to Instagram. With, you know, F1 cars, you know, we're just, they were just fans, you were fan. I post pictures of F1 cars, but because they had F1 in their name, FOM felt like there was a bit of confusion maybe that people would think they're affiliated with F1 in an official manner and they sought to take down these accounts, which is frankly completely absurd and uh, they've done stuff like that in the past. Last year, we had the same sort of fiasco with Twitter accounts. They were taking down Twitter accounts and now this year, it's Instagram accounts and also not only that, we won't get completely into it because I feel like it could potentially be a, a separate video in itself. So let us know in the comments below if you're watching this far. Yeah. Let us know in the comments if you want me, Tom and Cal to make a video, not a podcast video necessarily, just a video talking to each other about the FOM uh, controversy with taking down mods on various, not even F1 games, just racing games, and the old fiasco between FOM and just their general outlook on copyright. Um, we'll go Pretty. more to... Pretty much a state of F1, if you will. Yeah, state of F1 in the media, how they want to go about it in copyright terms and what 
what yeah. they're doing uh, because obviously a lot of you guys aren't on Twitter and that's where mainly most of the news goes down. So I do implore you guys, if you don't have Twitter, do sign up and uh, go, you know, yeah, it's Tom saying, you can go follow us, but follow F1 accounts and, you know, that's where most of the news goes down. That's where more more of the community is kind of based in Twitter. Uh, you know, you don't actually necessarily get a lot of the actual info on YouTube or other sites. Um, but yeah, let us know if you want us to go into that. But basically, essentially, FOM is... um. To put it lightly, being a bit of a D-bag, and uh, they're sort of just, it seems like they're kind of abusing their copyright powers a little bit too much, and just pushing down fans, younger fans, obviously, who are running these Instagram accounts, and who make these mods, and it's just, you know, I've, I've seen established press members who write articles for Autosport also agreeing with us and tweeting out that it just seems like they're pushing down um, the true fans, the dedicated fans and the fans who spend hours creating content for different games related to F1 or posting images because they really enjoy the sport, they want to share their interest in the photos, in the cars it's just a bit of a very messy situation so I'll, I'll sort of stop there, let us know if you want us to make a more in-depth video so let's uh, let's move on to the next little thing that um, was off off topic I guess well, obviously, on the topic of F1, Bernie Eccleston said this week that supposedly uh, he's, he sort of agreed to sell F1. He's awaiting confirmation from the CVC to see if the deal will be finalised. Obviously, the sum and to who it's been sold has not been told. It's been kept very yeah. confidential. All we know is that Bernie has agreed, in principle, to sell the sport. Now, this could be a good thing, depending <laughs> on who takes over. Or it the could person be. <laughs> who may take over might employ their, their financial power over the sport and just, you know, stake and completely restructure the sport, which is what everyone's begging for, or like what the GPDA are begging for. So it could be a blessing in disguise, or it could be bad. Yeah, you know? tread lightly. <laughs> so just got to take it with a pinch of salt at the moment. And also, uh, more news in regards to 2017. Now, there's been a couple of things this week that have been mentioned. And the main one is, um, it came out, I think, yesterday or today. I'm not 100% sure, but... There was an article on uh, Tobias Gruner's uh, website, a a AM US. I'm yeah, not sure it's a yeah, general website. Yeah, but, AMS, yeah. Uh, essentially, eight out of the current 11 teams on the grid have apparently, in principle, not agreed to do the 2017 rules in 2017. They feel like they're not necessary yet. And especially, they're not necessary as a whole in some ways, because if you look at it, the cars are so fast. On cars, they're fast enough. I, I literally told out before we came on, and there was a shocking statistic today. Rio Harrianto's FP1 time, and he finished last, by the way, was one-tenth faster than Kimi Raikkonen's first place FP1 time last year. They do reckon, like, the cars have got about four or five seconds faster this year, which is absolutely unbelievable. Like, if you look at it, I think it was um, in Australia, Lewis Hamilton's uh, qualifying lap was... Near Incredible. the 2011 time. It was just blistering, like really, really fast. And I, I've said, I, I literally put a tweet out myself yesterday saying, do we really need the 2017 rules to actually make the cars go faster? Obviously, we still need them to make the racing better, but the cars don't necessarily have to be stupidly fast. Yeah, the actual speed because, that they're racing. Like, in regards to this, obviously, there's another thing that came out. They did a sim, like a little sim run with what a 2017 prototype sort of spec car could look like. And it's around Catalonia, and it turns out there was 5.5 Gs through Catalonia turn three. That's which is the long right hand, if you don't know. Yeah, so you obviously Catalonia got turn one and turn two, which is sort of like a right left chicane, and then you got the long swooping turn three where Alonso yeah. had his preseason accident last year. And 5.5 G for that length of the corner, that is a lot. That is. You're, you're demanding yeah. physically too much, I think, from a driver for that point. Yeah, because so, it's quite a long corner. That's the thing. Like, I think. You know, in the past, we've had circuits like Turkey where they've experienced near to 5, 5.5, 5, yeah. but only for small spurts. But this is quite a long swooping corner. The all TV of, sort of all. TV angles deceive how small the corner is sometimes, I feel, from the wide angle. It is a very long swooping corner, which, yeah, well, that's a lot of G force. Turn one, turn one on turn two, for example. That, 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 that could, you know, that. Quick, that's like, some serious. Uh, yeah, that's some that's serious. They're gonna have to know. either do some real some work beckets, on their neck muscles, you know, or. <laughs> but it's like if you look at it, it sort of, it sort of has brought up the debate, and obviously these teams have disagreed with 2017 rules about it actually happening, and I can understand why. I mean, let's let's go back to like previous podcasts, and if you haven't watched them, I mean, we have discussed it before about the actual. No one knows exactly what 2017 car is gonna look like. There's been no agreement yet. I think there's a meeting on the 30th of April. That's the deadline to agree. Yes, yeah, the, <laughs> that's the deadline, like. and they haven't really. And it's a month. 
but no one has no bloody clue what the hell was going on with a 2017 yeah. car. So I think everyone's sort of taking their perception. Well, you know, I mean, the, 20, the 2016 cars are much faster than last year. And no one knows what the hell we're doing next year. So we might as well push it back to 2018. I think Pat Simmons said that as well. Yeah. So I'm, I mean, I'm sort of inclined to agree with him am, in that I'm sort of regard. Agree. In terms of if we really don't know, let's not rush into it. Let's really I, I just try like and the, figure the, out. The mentality sort of shifting into yeah. like... Okay, so F1 is in a bit of a bad state, so we might as well just push back major things until further notice. So, obviously, it's prob- there, there is certain problems and things you could discuss. Like, overall, like I said, I don't really care. I think the speed's actually pretty good now. The lap times are fast enough. You can see... Like, yeah, in I, terms of how I, the you fast can cars see are. The cars look faster. Like, some of the shots where they come whizzing around the corner and you get a brilliant panoramic view... You can physically see they're much faster and they've got a bit more downforce, which is crucial. But I feel, I feel like the speed doesn't really need to be a major issue anymore. Like they can still make the cars a bit wider if they want to. Like, But it's just the racing now. They have to try yeah. and find a way to keep maintain the same lap times, but also improve the racing by removing current error elements on the top of the car. Yeah, Here, which we discussed obviously. quite a lot in the last podcast. We went on a very long discussion about yeah. it. So, yeah, that's... All up in the air. Hope I'm gonna guess eventually, in like a month's time, we'll be making a podcast on uh, what that goes. So that's gonna be something to mull over. But uh, Tom, are there any last uh, topics to really discuss? Or I think we might be coming I'm to an just end. Looking, and I think we're coming to a bit of a natural end. Uh, I'm just looking real quick. And um, no, that's no, pretty much I it. I think just, that's it. I do want to touch up about Haas today. Yeah. And um, you forgot to mention. I think Grosjean sort of broke down at the end. I think he had a smoking engine, didn't he? Right at the end. Of oh, right. The, yeah, he had the front wing issue, but so, then yeah, he was smoking at the end as well. He went back out and he actually smoked his engine, so that's a bit of a interesting one for him. And oh, oh yeah, sorry, I, I wanted to say uh, regarding Alonso's crash in Australia, there was a lot of debate regarding his engine. Turns out they tried to recover the engine. They sent it back to Japan to Honda HQ to try and see if they could yep. somehow bring it back. But it turns out the engine's just scrapped, and they've got a new PU in the back of uh, yep. staff's car this weekend. And basically, Alonso is one engine short for the season, so cue the grid penalties later on this season. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think we're going to wrap that up. So, guys, if you have enjoyed that video, yeah, smash that like button. It would be absolutely awesome. We could try and get over 1,000 likes. As usual, let us know what you thought about the topics discussed. We want to know what you think. Um, you know, we may not, I'm, I, I may not reply from my account on, on this channel to any of your comments below, but trust me, I do read them through. Tom and Cal also read them through. It's very interesting to actually just get your opinions and gauges. And also, I've been seeing a lot of you just talking with each other, which is fantastic to try and create like a bit of a community feel around the podcast of you guys discussing it, coming to talk about real life Formula One and discussing it in depth in the comments, which is absolutely awesome to see. If you're new around here, then just to this channel for the podcast has been a bit of a supplementary 5.5 we'll be coming up with six on sunday for the bahrain grand prix discussion i'll try and get that out as fast as i can after the bahrain grand prix is over and we do that video but subscribe to tom as well if you have enjoyed his thoughts and check out his channel obviously callum is not with us he'll be joining us on sunday but yeah that's been it i hope you guys enjoyed that little supplementary and uh we'll see you guys next time i hope you enjoy us today hope you enjoy the bahrain grand prix weekend and uh we will see you on sunday goodbye